the dawn of a new day in Winnetha. Our motley crew of heroes, Aurora, Stray Dog, Drenger, and Dermon, wake up at the inn, their eyes still heavy with last night's endeavors. Their banter over breakfast centers around one pressing issue, how to snag Stray Dog an elusive ticket to the big party, just one tantalizing night away. Dermon proposes a quest to Nullbish to find the missing granddaughter of Mage Prince Lacaster. Noble quests make for noble reputations, he muses. But time is not on their side. Drenger, pragmatic as usual, counters with an alternative. Why not beat up a few more Eben Triad goons to polish our fame? Stray Dog, ever the maverick, has his own solo gig in mind. With feathers ruffled and beak sharpened, he decides to become a one-man band. Just as he steps outside, the city's excitement brushes against him like a fresh breeze. Words buzz through the crowd. The Grand Fair. Never one to resist curiosity, Stray Dog swoops down to the market square and discovers a cacophony of colors, sounds, and emotions. Amidst it all stands a grand pole, ropes swinging like vines in a wild jungle. It's not just any pole. By afternoon, it becomes a dizzying battleground for the city's best acrobats. With a flare of his feathers, Stray Dog performs some aerial acrobatics of his own and lands a spot in the competition. Showtime, he caws. Meanwhile, Drenger embarks on a different sort of quest, one of craftsmanship. Wandering through the city's labyrinthine streets, he learns from the Dwarven Smiths that Lashana's vigilance has mostly purged the Ebon Triad's taint. As for Aurora, her path is one of compassion. She roams, healing hands outstretched, attending to the ailing and the needy. But all is not well. Urgent news pierces their revelry. The village of Lindley, just two hours north of Winnetha, has been attacked by undead forces from Rinloru, ruled by the Dark Priest Delgath. A collective shudder runs down their spines. Lindley, known for its wineries, also happens to be supplying wine for Mage Prince Lacaster's grand celebration. A glance at the sky, a quick calculation, and the heroes realize they can save the village and make it back in time for Stray Dog's acrobatic showdown. As they scramble to find horses for their urgent mission, a familiar sight catches their eye. Bacrus, their dastardly rival, is mustering his own crew. The stakes are high, the clock is ticking, and now they have competition. The heroes arrive to find Lindley a ghost town, its eerie silence punctuated by the scattered corpses showing signs of life utterly drained. Stray Dog and Dareman's scouting mission uncovers a chilling reality. Shadows, ethereal creatures, haunting the houses. Shadows attack and our heroes retreat, opting for quick strategy over prolonged battle. Drenger, always the pragmatist, urges them toward their primary objective, securing the wine for the grand party. Finding the wagon loaded with caskets, they're interrupted by the clanging sounds of a skirmish. It's Bacruz, and he's under siege. However, before our heroes can even contemplate alliances, more shadows materialize, impervious to the daylight lunging at them. Drenger's blade cuts through the dark forms with ease, while Dermen and Stray Dog keep others at bay. But it's Aurora, blessed by Foltis, whose divine light dances across the battlefield, disintegrating the shadows to mere whispers. Victory is in sight until Stray Dog feels his very life force ebbing away with a strike. The crisis intensifies as a giant shadow, radiating an aura of pure darkness, steps forth. The tables turn dangerously, but our heroes are not deterred. Aurora counteracts the dark aura, and together they focus their attacks, defeating the monstrosity. The few remaining shadows fizzle out, vanquished by Aurora's celestial glow. Bacrus offers a truce, suggesting they share the glory. Our heroes scoff at the notion, dismissing him as an undeserving glory seeker. Back in the city, the wine is delivered, and although Stray Dog's role as the mastermind behind the plan is questioned, the day's objective is largely accomplished. There's no rest for the weary. Stray Dog, weakened but driven, races back to the Grand Fair for the acrobatic competition already in progress. The climax is a spectacle. Acrobats must capture colorful birds while swinging from the ever-accelerating pole. Undaunted, Stray Dog dares a jaw-dropping move, gripping the rope with just his legs, arms reaching for a feathered prize. 
time freezes, breaths are held, but destiny has its own designs. A miscalculation launches stray dog like a bolt through the air, crashing into a stall a daunting 20 meters away. Today's hero becomes today's spectacle, and the prize goes to another. The morning after their adventures and a night of rest, our heroes receive a package at the inn. Stray Dog finds himself invited to Prince Lacaster's grand feast, courtesy of a cheery note from Armin Loratio. Come afternoon, the heroes are whisked away in a grand carriage, soon arriving at a palace bustling with the finest citizens in all their glory. The only hiccup, they were expected to bring gifts, a detail they somehow overlooked. After depositing their weapons, the heroes ascend to a grand garden terrace, a place of beauty overlooking the infinite expanse of the sea. Mingling ensues. Aurora speaks with Almer Kozin, the chief cleric of Bakob, who's overwhelmed by his latest responsibility, managing the city's cemetery. Stray Dog engages with a flamboyant older man, Drenger with Lord Mervin Killraven, who voices his concerns over the looming threat of Rinloru, and Dareman chats with a somewhat anxious halfling female, Meeson Mitchwillow. Finally, Prince Lacaster makes his appearance along with his fool, the ominous Fabler, a gnome-like creature dressed in crimson and clutching a mummified raven. The time for gift-giving has arrived. Our heroes fumble their offerings. Dareman's gift of a hundred gold pieces is received tepidly. Drenger offers his sword, but not his loyalty. And Stray Dog and Aurora, despite their good intentions, seem to have missed the memo on the gifting etiquette. Fortunately, their role in delivering the wine for the event saves some face. The next event is the Harlequined Mortificatio, a puppet show using animated skeletons that carries a rather grim and possibly allegorical message. Despite the macabre nature of the performance, the wine and almond biscuits provided make it quite palatable. Then comes the handsome slaughter of curious avians. Prince Lacaster sets a high bar, taking down six colorful birds that erupt into magical plumes as they are struck. Dareman, stepping up to the plate, nearly matches the prince's skill, earning some approval from him. But the night is far from over. The fool, displaying impressive acrobatic skill, guides the guests through a labyrinthine series of hallways and doors, finally reaching a fighting pit in the palace's underbelly. Here, a new challenge is presented controlling cockatrices via magic rings to turn feral cats into stone statues. Dareman competes valiantly, but the prince pulls ahead in the end, winning a large golden egg as his prize. Bathed in the soft twilight glow, our heroes find themselves back on the terraced garden that overlooks the breathtaking expanse of the sea. The atmosphere is thick with intrigue as they seize the opportunity to mingle and extract valuable insights from other attendees. Aurora, her eyes glinting with sacred light, navigates through the social tapestry to Virus Spatol, a foreboding man dressed in attire that screams authority. As the self-proclaimed chief cleric of the Church of Hexter, he boasts that his faith is the true spiritual backbone of Wienada. Aurora, ever the curious cleric, probes about the forgotten church of St. Cuthbert, only to hit a dead end. The church was condemned years ago and no further details are offered. Meanwhile, Dareman's eyes lock onto a unique figure in the crowd, Zorus, an albino man who speaks with an exotic cadence. The half-drow learns that Zorus hails from the Sewell race far to the north and has wed his way into the noble house of Garesteth. The two exchange thoughtful nods, each sizing up the other's intentions and capabilities. Stray Dog, the Kenku rogue, finds himself embroiled in a conversation with Mahudril, an older woman with a merchant's savvy. She bombards him with questions, all while expressing a deep curiosity about Prince Lacaster's rumored plans against the hostile princedom of Rinloru. The Kenku remains elusive, never letting his beak betray too much. Drenger's conversation with Miss and Mitchwillow, a visibly anxious and rotund halfling, yields little in the way of useful information. But Drenger's sharp instincts tell him that every interaction has its value, even if not immediately apparent. As conversations hum and wine flows, a singular question percolates among the heroes. Where is Lashana? 
the enigmatic partner of the prince is conspicuously absent, though the other guests are quick to brush it off as her being fashionably late. And then, the moment shatters. The ominous fabler, a gnome clutching a mummified raven, his hat as eccentric as his demeanor, takes the stage. His voice pierces the gentle murmur of the crowd, announcing the next thrilling event. Bowling the devious heads, 